Herodotus Histories, Part 3. I will now tell what befell Croesus himself. He had a son, of whom I have already spoken, a likely youth enough, save that he was dumb. Now in his past days of prosperity, Croesus had done all that he could for his son, and besides resorting to other plans, he had sent to Delphi to inquire of the oracle concerning him. The Pythian priestess thus answered him, Lydian, of many the Lord, thou knowest not the boon that thou askest. Wish not, nor pray, that the voice of thy son may be heard in the palace. Better it were for thee, that dumb he abide as aforetime. Luckless that day shall be, when first thou hearest him speaking. So in other words, she's telling him, be careful what you wish for. You do not want to hear your son speak. Here's why. So at the taking of the fortress, a certain Persian, not knowing who Croesus was, came at him with intent to kill him. Croesus saw him coming, but by stress of misfortune he was past caring, and would as soon be smitten to death as not. But this dumb son, seeing the Persian coming, in his fear and his grief, broke into speech and cried, Man, do not kill Croesus! This was the first word he uttered, and after that, for all the days of his life, he had power of speech. So the Persians took Sardis and made Croesus himself prisoner, he having reigned fourteen years and been besieged fourteen days, and, as the oracle foretold, brought his own great empire to an end. We'll pause right there. If you recall, earlier in the book he had gone to the oracle to ask if he should attack the Persian empire, and the oracle at Delphi told him, you will destroy a great empire if you attack the Persians. And he was very pleased because he thought that meant he would destroy the Persian empire, but in fact it was his own. Continuing on. Having then taken him, they led him to Cyrus. Cyrus had a great pyre built on which he set Croesus, bound in chains, and twice seven Lydian boys beside him. Either his intent was to sacrifice these first fruits to some one of his gods, or he desired to fulfill a vow, or it may be that, learning that Croesus was a god-fearing man, he set him for this cause on the pyre, because he would fain to know if any deity would save him from being burnt alive. It is related, then, that he did this, but Croesus, as he stood on the pyre, remembered even in his evil plight how divinely inspired was that saying of Solon that no living man was blessed. When this came to his mind, having till now spoken no word, he sighed deeply and groaned, and thrice uttered the name of Solon. Cyrus heard it, and bade his interpreters ask Croesus who was this on whom he called. They came near and asked him. Croesus at first would say nothing in answer, but presently, being compelled, he said, it is one with whom I would have given much wealth that all sovereigns should hold converse. This was a dark saying to them, and again they questioned him of the words which he spoke. As they were instant and troubled him, he told them then how Solon, an Athenian, had first come, and how he had seen all his royal state and made light of it, saying thus and thus, and how all had happened to Croesus as Solon said, though he spoke with less regard to Croesus than to mankind in general, and chiefly those who deemed themselves blessed. While Croesus thus told his story, the pyre had already been kindled, and the outer parts of it were burning. Then Cyrus, when he heard from the interpreters what Croesus said, repented of his purpose. He bethought him that he, being also a man, was burning alive another man who had once been as fortunate as himself. Moreover, he feared the retribution, and it came to his mind that there was no stability in human affairs. Wherefore, he gave command to quench the burning fire with all speed, and bring Croesus and those with him down from the pyre. But his servants could not, for all their endeavor, now master the fire. So Cyrus sets Croesus up on this pyre, this big stack of wood, to burn him alive. For uncertain reasons, whether it's a sacrifice, it seems more likely he's trying to test his piety and see if one of the gods will save him. And this reminds me a little bit of some of the stories in the Bible with the Babylonian kings. Think of Nebuchadnezzar. They, they seem to be very impulsive, don't they? As threatening death to somebody. They will just put somebody to death and then sort of watch with interest to see what happens and then suddenly seem to get insight or change their mind. Think about the incident in the book of Daniel with the lion's den or the fiery furnace and these kings would just decree death but then they'd kind of want to see what would happen. It was almost like a contest of the gods. You might also think of the episode with the prophet Elijah testing the gods of Baal when he invites them to call down fire from heaven on the pyre. So maybe Cyrus is kind of doing something like that. He wants to see what sort of man this Croesus is and what sort of gods are his gods. 
Then, so the Lydians relate, when Crassus was aware of Cyrus's repentance and saw all men striving to quench the fire, but no longer able to check it, he cried aloud to Apollo, praying that if the god had ever been pleased with any gift of his offering, he would now come to his aid and save him from present destruction. Thus with weeping he invoked the god, and suddenly in a clear and windless sky clouds gathered and a storm burst, and there was a most violent rain, so that the pyre was quenched. Then indeed Cyrus perceived that Croesus was a good man, and one beloved of the gods, and bringing him down from the pyre he questioned him, saying, What man persuaded you, Croesus, to attack my country with an army, and be my enemy instead of my friend? O king, said Croesus, it was I who did it, and brought thereby good fortune to you and ill to myself. But the cause of all was the god of the Greeks, in that he encouraged me to send my army. No man is so foolish as to desire war more than peace, for in peace sons bury their fathers, but in war fathers bury their sons. But I must believe that heaven willed all this to be. So said Croesus. Then Cyrus loosed him, and set him near to himself, and took much thought for him, and both he and all that were with him were astonished when they looked upon Croesus. He, for his part, was silent, deep in thought. Presently he turned and said, for he saw the Persians sacking the city of the Lydians, O king, am I to say to you now what is in my mind, or keep silence? Cyrus, bidding him to say boldly what he would. Croesus asked, Yonder multitude, what is this whereon they are so busily engaged? They are plundering, said Cyrus, your city, and carrying off your possessions. Nay, Croesus answered, not my city, nor my possessions, for I have no longer any share of all this. It is your wealth that they are ravishing. So we can contrast this situation with Croesus and Cyrus with the situation earlier between Croesus and Solon, in which Solon was the wise man who saw through the vicissitudes of the gods and he saw the true nature of of the life of man, how it was hardship and you couldn't really tell if a man was blessed or not until the end of his life. He was a more big picture wise man and Croesus at that time was very short-sighted and materialistic and he seemed to lack that wisdom. Now it seems that the tables have turned and because of his experience of loss and near death, Croesus has become the wise man and suddenly he is speaking these words of wisdom to Cyrus. He sees more clearly. Cyrus is like, yeah, those guys are plundering your city. And he points out to him, that's not my city anymore. You conquered it. It's your city. They're wrecking your stuff. It's yours now. Cyrus thought upon what Croesus said, and bidding the rest withdraw, he asked Croesus what fault he saw in what was being done. Since the gods, replied the Lydian, have given me to be your slave, it is right that if I have any clearer sight of wrong done, I should declare it to you. The Persians are violent men by nature, and poor withal. If then you suffer them to seize and hold great possessions, you may expect that he who has won most will rise in revolt against you. Now therefore do this, if what I say finds favor with you. Set men of your guard to watch all the gates. Let them take the spoil from those who are carrying it out, and say that it must be paid as tithe to Zeus. Thus shall you not be hated by them for taking their wealth by force. And they, for their part, will acknowledge that you act justly, and will give up the spoil willingly. So now Croesus becomes something of an advisor to Cyrus, and he points out a cultural difference, that the Lydians are a luxurious, wealthy people, and the Persians are not. And therein lies their strength. The Persians are rugged, mountain, desert people. They're warriors. They're not accustomed to luxury. And Croesus knows that if the Persians get all this wealth and they become accustomed to luxury, they're going to become soft. They're going to lose their power. So he cautions Cyrus about this. He says, don't let your men just start indulging in all this new wealth and plunder they have. You should take it from them. But so that they don't get too angry, say that this is an offering to the god Zeus who gave victory. Make it, make it an act of piety. Then they will respect you as a holy and righteous king and not just a king who's taking all the stuff that they won by force. Because that traditionally has been part of the law of war. You get to keep what you conquer. Plunder was one of the motivations for men who went to fight all throughout history. And so to deprive the warriors of their plunder, a king would often find that that's a really quick way to lose warriors. You can ask the Romans about that later on and many other peoples. So he's cautioning him, you should take their plunder, don't let them have all this new stuff, but so they don't get angry at it, make it an act of piety that will be respectable. 
When Cyrus heard this, he was exceedingly pleased, for he deemed the counsel good, and praising him greatly, and bidding his guards to act as Croesus had counseled, he said, Croesus, now that you, a king, are resolved to act and to speak aright, ask me now for whatever boon you desire forthwith. Master, said Croesus, you will best please me if you suffer me to send these my chains to that god of the Greeks whom I chiefly honored, and to ask him if it be his custom to deceive those who serve him well. Cyrus then asking him what charge he brought against the god that he made this request. Croesus repeated to him the tale of all his own intent, and the answers of the oracles, and more especially his offerings, and how it was the oracle that had heartened him to attack the Persians. And so saying, he once more instantly entreated that he might be suffered to reproach the god for this. At this Cyrus smiled and replied, This I will grant you, Croesus, and what other boon soever you may at any time ask me. When Croesus heard this, he sent men of the Lydians to Delphi, charging them to lay his chains on the threshold of the temple, and to ask if the god were not ashamed that he had persuaded Croesus to attack the Persians, telling him that he would destroy Cyrus's power, of which power, they should say, showing the chains, these were the first fruits. Thus they should inquire, and further, if it were the manner of the Greek gods to be thankless. So it's a little bit interesting here, the manner of Cyrus. In a very Asiatic fashion, he has only just conquered this king. He's still, his men are still sacking his city. They're still plundering his city, and he's already become best friends. He's like, wow, this guy's really wise. Ask me anything you want. I'll grant it. Again, you see that sort of vacillation between the brutality he was burning him alive a couple minutes earlier, and suddenly he's offering him anything he wants. It's very much like we see characteristic of the Babylonian and Persian kings in the Bible as well. One minute they're, they're ready to put you to death for any offense, and the next minute they're granting you half their kingdom. That seems to be the style here. But Croesus has in mind to go ask Apollo what his deal is. I gave you all these offerings, and you told me this thing that sounded like I should go attack the Persians. You basically tricked me. And is that how you repay those who are faithful to you and who give you all these offerings? Croesus has a bone to pick with the god, and we're going to see where that goes. When the Lydians came and spoke as they were charged, the priestess, it is said, thus replied, None may escape his destined lot, not even a god. Croesus hath paid for the sin of his ancestor of the fifth generation, who, being of the guard of the Heraclidae, was led by the guile of a woman to slay his master, and took to himself the royal state of that master, whereto he had no right. And it was the desire of Luxius, that's Apollo, that the evil hap of Sardis should fall in the lifetime of Croesus' sons, not his own. But he could not turn the fates from their purpose. Yet did he accomplish his will and favor Croesus insofar as they would yield to him, for he delayed the taking of Sardis for three years, and this let Croesus know, that though he be now taken, it is by so many years later than the destined hour. And further, Luxia saved Croesus from the burning. But as to the oracle that was given him, Croesus doth not write to complain concerning it. For Luxius declared to him that if he should lead an army against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. Therefore it behoved him, if he would take right counsel, to send and ask whether the god spoke of Croesus's or Cyrus's empire. But he understood not that which was spoken, nor made further inquiry. Wherefore now let him blame himself. Nay, when he asked that last question of the oracle, and Luxius gave him that answer concerning the mule, even that Croesus understood not. For that mule was in truth Cyrus, who was the son of two persons not of the same nation of whom the mother was the nobler and the father of lesser estate, for she was a Median, the daughter of Astyages, king of the Medians. But he was a Persian and under the rule of the Medians, and was wedded, albeit in all regards lower than she, to one that should be his sovereign lady. Such was the answer of the priestess to the Lydians. They carried it to Sardis and told it to Croesus, and when he heard it, he confessed that the sin was not the gods, but his own. And this is the story of Croesus' rule and of the first overthrow of Ionia. All right, so a couple of comments about ancient Greek cosmology. Notice what the priestess says. None may escape his destined lot, not even a god. So even though the ancient Greeks acknowledged these gods, the rulers of all things, yet there was a sovereign power that was above the gods, and that was fate. And the Greeks personified fate as many cultures did as three women the fates 
And it was actually they who decreed what could happen. So fate is sovereign even over the gods. There is a preordained will for things. And we never really get to look into what the will of the fates cause is precisely. But that's an interesting note that even the gods themselves cannot escape the dictates of fate. And it's tying this story back to the one at the beginning with with Gyges and Kandalis and how the line of the Heraclidae was supplanted by a ruse, the servant killing his master. And how even though they inquired of the god and asked their counsel and the god said, oh, no, he should be the ruler, but there was still a price to be paid for killing the descendant of Hercules and taking the throne, whereto he had no right. So in this answer, the god Apollo is justifying himself, but keep in mind, look at how this story is, is weaving a little bit. It was the god Apollo who decreed that Gyges should be the king, that he should be the ruler, and that headship should not return to the Heraclidae. And now he's saying, oh, this was the punishment for doing that. Croesus had to pay for the sin of his ancestor of the fifth generation. Now, it was decreed at that time that there would be a price to pay in the fifth generation. But if you remember what it says, they didn't pay much attention to that. So now it's caught up to him. So it was Apollo who allowed this to happen, but now there's a price to be paid. And he says that no one can escape fate. No one can change his destined lot, not even a god. But down here a little bit further, it says, oh, but I did change fate. I delayed it for three years later than it was supposed to be. And so you might wonder when Croesus is hearing this, does he, does he question, well, how would I know if that's true? If a god can't even change the fate, and then four sentences later, he's saying, but I did change the fate. I, I delayed it for three years. You can kind of see a little bit the games that these gods seem to be playing with them. They're justifying themselves, and they're always right, and they can speak cryptically and things like that, and they can give these kind of tricky answers but it's the human's fault for not seeing what the truth is. Even though the gods know, they couch it in such a mysterious way. It's the human's fault for not figuring it out. And Croesus accepts this. When, he, when the prophecy was given that, that unless a mule was ruling, he would be able to conquer the Persians, well, Croesus believed it meant a, a literal mule, the animal. But what is a mule? A mule is the offspring of a donkey and a horse, two different kinds of animals, but they can reproduce. They create a mule. And so basically this is just an analogy for a half-breed. Cyrus is the daughter of a Median and a Persian. Now at the time, the Persians were ruled by the Medians. And so his mother was actually more noble than the father. Like a horse is more noble than a donkey. And so it's this whole analogy thing. But the god is like, I, I told you that. I, you know, I, I made it clear that it was a mule which represented this man because... Croesus is like, okay, that's fine. I guess it's my fault, not the gods. Just a little interesting little insight into ancient Greek and um, pagan cosmology. Now, there are many offerings of Croesus in Hellas, and not only those whereof I have spoken. There is a golden tripod at Thebes in Boeotia, which is, he dedicated to Apollo of Ismenus. At Ephesus, there are the oxen of gold and the greater part of the pillars. And in the temple of Pronea at Delphi, a golden shield. All of these yet remain till my lifetime, but some other of the offerings have perished. And the offerings of Croesus at Branchidae of the Milesians, as I have heard, are equal in weight and like to those at Delphi. Those which he dedicated at Delphi and the shrine of Amphiaros were his own, the first fruits of the wealth inherited from his father. The rest came from the estate of an enemy who had headed a faction against Croesus before he became king and conspired to win the throne of Lydia for Pantaleon. This Pantaleon was a son of Aliates and a half-brother of Croesus. Croesus was Aliates' son by a Carian, and Pantaleon by an Ionian mother. So when Croesus gained the sovereignty by his father's gift, he put the man who had conspired against him to death by drawing him across a carding comb, and first confiscated his estate, then dedicated as and where I have said. This is all that I shall say of Croesus' offerings. So if you don't know what a carding comb is, it's this metal comb, two metal combs that kind of lock together and it's used for taking wool and kind of raking it and combing it into nice straight thin strands for spinning. So that's a very creative way to kill somebody is to drag him across carding combs till he dies. 
There are not in Lydia many marvelous things for me to tell of, if it be compared with other countries, except the gold dust that comes down from Tmolus. But there is one building to be seen there which is more notable than any, saving those of Egypt and Babylon. There is in Lydia the tomb of Aliates, the father of Croesus, the base whereof is made of great stones, and the rest of it of mounded earth. It was built by the men of the market, and the artificers and the prostitutes. There remained till my time five cornerstones set at the top of the tomb, and on these was graven the record of the work done by each kind, and measurement showed that the prostitutes' share of the work was the greatest. All the daughters of the common people of Lydia apply the trade of prostitutes to collect dowries, till they can get themselves husbands, and they offer themselves in marriage. Now this tomb has a circumference of six furlongs and a third, and its breadth is above two furlongs. And there is a great lake hard by the tomb, which, say the Lydians, is fed by an ever-flowing springs. It is called the Gygean Lake. Such then is this tomb. And if you go to the Gygean Lake in modern-day Turkey, you can actually see this tomb of King Aliates. You can see in the picture here, it's called a tumulus. It's like a, a man-made pyramid mountain, quite large. The customs of the Lydians are like those of the Greeks, save that they make prostitutes of their female children. They were the first men known to us who coined and used gold and silver currency, and they were the first to sell by retail. And, according to what they themselves say, the pastimes now in use among them and the Greeks were invented by the Lydians. These, they say, were invented among them at the time when they colonized Tyrrhenia. This is their story. In the reign of Attis, son of Manes, there was a great scarcity of food in all Lydia. For a while the Lydians bore this with what patience they could. Presently, when there was no abatement of the famine, they sought for remedies, and diverse plans were devised by diverse men. Then it was that they invented the games of dice and knucklebones and ball, and all other forms of pastime, except only draughts, which the Lydians do not claim to have discovered. Then, using their discovery to lighten the famine, they would play for the whole of every other day, that they might not see, have to seek for food, and the next day they ceased from their play and ate. This was their manner of life for eighteen years, but the famine did not cease to plague them, and rather afflicted them yet more grievously. At last their king divided the people into two portions and made them draw lots, so that the one part should remain and the other leave the country. He himself was to be the head of those who drew the lot to remain there, and his son, whose name was Tyrannus, of those who departed. Then one part of them, having drawn the lot, left the country, and came down to Smyrna and built ships, whereon they set all their goods that could be carried on shipboard, and sailed away to seek a livelihood in a country, till at last, after sojourning with many nations in turn, they came to the Umbriki, where they founded cities and have dwelt ever since. They no longer call themselves Lydians, but Tyrrhenians, after the name of the king's son, who had led them thither. So... The Tyrrhenians would be what we know as the Etruscans. So this is an origin story for the Etruscans in central Italy. And in fact, the tribal name that he gives here, the Ombrici, that refers to the native people of the region of Italy, which still to this day is known as Umbria. So basically the same tribal name is passed down into modern times. Tyrrhenian is the Greek designation for the Etruscan peoples of Italy, although many scholars, including several ancient writers, dispute this story of the Lydian origin for the Etruscans, mostly on linguistic grounds. But to this day, the sea right next to Italy, in between Italy and Corsica and Sardinia, is called the Tyrrhenian Sea. The Lydians, then, were enslaved by the Persians. But it is next the business of my history to inquire who this Cyrus was who brought down the power of Croesus, and how the Persians came to be rulers of Asia. I mean then to be guided in what I write by some of the Persians who desire not to make a fine tale of the story of Cyrus, but to tell the truth, though there are no less than three other accounts of Cyrus which I could give. So he's claiming credibility for this account of Cyrus based on the truthfulness of it, rather than some of the other ones he's heard. He's still obviously making the judgment call on that for us, but we'll have to take his word for it for the time being. When the Assyrians had ruled Upper Asia for 520 years, their subjects began to revolt from them. First of all, the Medes. These, it would seem, proved their valor in fighting for freedom against the Assyrians. They cast off their slavery and won freedom. Afterwards, the other subject nations, too, did the same as the Medes. 
So these Assyrians who ruled Upper Asia, the Assyrian Empire was a Mesopotamian kingdom and empire in the ancient Near East and Levant. That refers to sort of Canaan, Israel, Phoenicia, Syria, that area. It existed as a state from around the 25th century BC all the way until about 612 to 609 BC. And these were the conquerors of the northern kingdom of Israel in the Bible. And they were legendary for their brutality in war. In fact, in one of the king's palaces in one of the Assyrian cities, there are carvings on the wall of them flaying, skinning war captives alive. They sort of gloried in their ferociousness in war. So Nineveh, of biblical fame, was at one time their capital city, and it was the largest city in the world at the time. If you recall from the story of Jonah, Nineveh was that evil city of the Assyrians that God sent a prophet to tell them to repent. And the Medes, or the Madai, they were one of the major people groups of the Persian Empire. They came from the area of north and central Iran. And they were known as rugged mountain fighters. The Madai people were comprised of six tribes, one of which was the Magi tribe. And this was a priestly tribe that came to be associated with wise men, astrologers, and wizards. In fact, we even get our word magic from the name for their tribe. So if you think of the three Magi, you might remember them from the gospel narrative of the three wise men who came from Persia to greet the infant Christ. All of those on the mainland were now free men, but they came once more to be ruled by monarchs, as I will now relate. There was among the Medians a clever man called Dioces. He was the son of Phraortes. Dioces was enamored of sovereignty, and thus he set about gain gaining it. Being already a notable man in his own township, one of the many townships into which Media was parceled, he began to profess and practice justice more constantly and zealously than ever, this he did, although there was much lawlessness in all the land of Media, and though he knew that injustice is ever the foe of justice. Then the Medes of the same township, seeing his dealings, chose him to be their judge, and he, for he coveted sovereign power, was honest and just. By so acting he won no small praise from his fellow townsmen, insomuch that when the men of the other townships learned that Dioces alone gave righteous judgments, they having before suffered from unjust decisions, they then, on hearing this, came often and gladly to plead before Dioces, and at last they would submit to no arbitrament but his. All right, so this is a story of how this royal line is going to begin. And you might think of media that he's describing at this time as kind of like the Wild West, right? It's all sort of lawlessness and violence. And so they're judges, but most of them are probably corrupt, and they take bribes, not very good. This guy wants the power. He's motivated by ambition to power, which is unusual for a man who's described as honest and just. So just worthy of note right there. So he starts practicing judgment, and he becomes renowned for actually being righteous and honest and just. And so more and more people come to put their trust in him and allow him to have a say in their affairs, in their legal cases. The number of those who came grew ever greater, for they heard that each case ended as accorded with the truth. Then Dioces, seeing that all was now entrusted to him, would not sit in his former seat of judgment, and said he would give no more decisions, for it was of no advantage to him, he said, to leave his own business and spend all the day judging the cases of his neighbors. This caused robbery and lawlessness to increase greatly in the townships, and the Medes gathering together conferred about their present affairs and said, here, as I suppose, the chief speakers were Dioces's friends. Since we cannot with our present manner of life dwell peacefully in the country, come, let us set up a king for ourselves. Thus will the country be well governed, and we ourselves shall betake ourselves to our business, and cease to be undone by lawlessness. By such words they persuaded themselves to be ruled by a king. So Herodotus speculates that the guys who put forward this proposal might have been placed there. Maybe they were Dioces's friends. So he sort of set this whole thing up, this withdrawal from public life, and then some well-placed friends to bring about his election, as it were, as king. The question was forthwith propounded, whom should they make king? Then every man was loud in putting Dioces forward and praising Dioces, till they agreed that he should be their king. 
He bade them build him houses worthy of his royal power and arm him with a bodyguard. The Medes did so. They built him great and strong houses at what places soever in the country he showed them and suffered him to choose a bodyguard out of all their people. But having obtained the power, he constrained the Medes to make him one stronghold and to fortify this more strongly than all the rest. This too the Medes did for him. So he built the great and mighty circles of walls within walls, which are now called Ekbatana. This fortress is so planned that each circle of walls is higher than the next outer circle by no more than the height of its battlements, to which end the site itself, being on a hill in the plain, somewhat helps, but chiefly it was accomplished by art. There are seven circles in all. Within the innermost circle are the king's dwellings and the treasuries, and the longest wall is about the length of the wall that surrounds the city of Athens. The battlements of the first circle are white, of the second black, of the third circle purple, of the fourth blue, and of the fifth orange. Thus the battlements of the five circles are painted with colors, and the battlements of the last two circles are coated, these with silver and those with gold. So this might sound like a parallel if you remember back to the book of Kings when the Hebrew people don't have a king and they're suffering under bad judges. And so they ask the prophet to choose a king for them. They, anoint, they appoint Saul. They choose Saul to be the king. And the prophet warns them. He says, if you make a king, he's going to do all these things. He's going to ha- build all these houses. He's going to take all the young men to war. He's going to drain you with taxes. He gives them all these warnings. And they say, no, no, we want a king. So it's a very similar situation going on here with the Medes. They've suffered so much from this lack of security and lawlessness that they're willing to do quite a lot of things just to have a king who can maintain order. So they build this city of Ekpatana with the seven walls. You can see the layout of the city that as it's been found archaeologically. So it's not quite seven concentric walls, one within each other exactly, but you get the idea. And it's built on a hill so that the height of the inner walls is higher than the outer walls. And he says that it's partly because it's on a hill, on a plain, but also because of art. In other words, they built the inner walls higher. And if you're familiar with Plato's story of Atlantis, the attention he pays to the colors of the walls and even the inner walls being coated with silver and gold, that should ring a bell in your mind. That's actually a motif that appears in the Atlantis story as well, with their three rings of concentric walls with orichalcum, silver, and gold. Diocese built these walls for himself and around his own palace. The people were to dwell without the wall. And when all was built, it was Diocese first who established the rule that no one should come into the presence of the king, but all should be dealt with by the means of messengers, that the king should be seen by no man, and moreover that it should be in particular a disgrace for any to laugh or to spit in his presence. He was careful to hedge himself with all this state in order that the men of his own age who had been bred up with him, and were as nobly born as he and his equals in manly excellence, instead of seeing him and being thereby vexed and happily moved to plot against him, might by reason of not seeing him deem him to be changed from what he had been. So in a rather shrewd move, he is distancing himself from the other noble men who still remember him and would think of him as one of them. He is creating all these barriers so to create the illusion of him being elevated to a different state to create that sense of distance and wonder and awe which inspires that kind of fear and respect. No one can see the king except with messengers. So you have to sort of stand outside the presence. It was very much like a temple ceremony to get an audience with the king. So he's subtly crafting in their minds a subconscious sense that he is more like a god than a man. Having ordered all these matters and strongly armed himself with sovereign power, he was a hard man in the observance of justice. They would write down their pleas and send them in to him. Then he would adjudge upon what was brought him and send his judgments out. This was his manner of deciding cases at law, and he took order too about other matters. For when he heard that a man was doing violence, he would send for him and punish him as befitted each offense, and he had spies and eavesdroppers everywhere in his dominions. Diocese then united the Median nation and no other and ruled it. So it was not an empire as yet. The Median tribes are these, the Busai, the Paratasani, the Strucates, the Arizanti, the Budii, the Magi, 
so many are their tribes. So as I mentioned, the Magi were the priests of the ancient Iranian Zoroastrian religion, but they're commonly associated in the classical world with astrologers, with mystical initiates, and wizards of any nation, hence the root of our word magic. So this reference in Herodotus is the only place I could find that identifies Magi with an actual tribe. But it, it may be that the names happen to be the same, but they are two different unrelated things. So in most classical references, Magi refers to a certain type of person. Like I said, somebody who is an astrologer or a priest or a mystic of some sort. And I could not find any other references to an ancient tribe of Medians that was known by this name. But this is Herodotus' account. <clears throat> 